Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians chapter 2. Today, I believe God wants you to see what a life of sin does to a human being. He also wants to show you the way out. And he wants to show you, once he has shown you the way out, how to operate in the fullness of his power. Are you paying attention this morning? God wants to show you what sin does to you. He wants to show you the way out, and he wants to show you how to live a life of power once you're out of sin. Ephesians chapter 2 is what we're going to be walking in this morning. And I'm going to start with my version of the picture of the earth. I know that this is probably not accurate, but somewhat you get the idea. I think Florida's here, honey, right here. <laughs> it's right there. That's Brazil. That's Brazil. This is the Atlantic Ocean, and that's the rest of the world. All right? But may I tell you, just like you are at the mall and they have those wonderful maps for you, you are here. Just in case you're not sure where you're at, you are on planet Earth. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. That's just where we're going to start. You are here on planet Earth. And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses in sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. What happens to you when you are in a life of sin? I would like to convey it by picture form this morning for you. It says that we were dead in our trespasses. That for some reason we were trapped by something that is literally a force around the entire earth. Look at verse 2 in your Bible. It says, In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Do you know that there are atmospheric conditions that surround the globe that are controlled by Satan? Do you recognize that by what this passage says? That literally inside of this bubble of atmosphere, the prince of the air controls what goes on down here such that when you are born into this earth, you conform to the way earthlings do things. Amen? You conform to the patterns I can tell because none of you is wearing the hairstyle from the 1950s. Why? Because we're cool. <laughs> it, it, it was cool back then. And, you know, I, I look back and I see some of the fashions. They change over time. Why do we change our clothes with the fashions that are popular? We think that it comes out of New York, we think that it comes out of Paris, but do you know where it comes from? It is fed from the prince of the power of the air down into the world. People come up with things, patterns of, of worldly things that we all do and participate in, and Satan is the prince over this principality doing whatever he can to get all of us to conform to the pattern of this world. Have you ever conformed to the pattern of the world? Let's see. What is popular to do, let's start at the end of the year, 
around December 25th. What do we do? Papa Noel, Santa Claus, Christmas trees, the lights, the whatever, the decorations. We all do it. Why? Why do we do it? Because everybody else is doing it. It's a tradition and we conform to the pattern and some of us who are believers say that we're doing it in the name of Jesus. It's funny. Really. It's quite comical. But let's go into the new year. Let's go into January. Is there any traditions that we do in the month of January? The New Year's resolution. That's what I was looking for. Because you ate all the cookies back here, you realized you put on 20 pounds and you said, oh no, I better have my New Year's resolution and you can track the pattern. Let's get into February. What happens then? Halloween. Come on. Valentine's. St. Valentine's Day. But prior to that, some creature comes out of the ground and tells us whether or not we're going to have six more weeks of winter. Strange phenomenon. Strange phenomenon. But each month, we could go right down through the month and there's things that there are people in the advertising industry that are just waiting for you to conform, to conform to the pattern of the world so that you will, in February, do what? Go over to the bridge view and have dinner with your significant other and celebrate love. Right? You will buy cherry-covered Chocolate covered cherries. You will buy M&M's. You will buy all of the chocolate. You will buy roses on demand, men. And what does the advertising industry know? Suckers. We've got suckers on every corner. What normally cost about 6 to $12 a dozen every other time of the year what is it marked up to? $39 a dozen. So there is a whole system of conformity that is based upon the calendar months of the year and people in the world are just counting on you to conform to everything that is happening around you. The phenomenon of the Super Bowl being on today is a phenomena of itself that has caused a worldwide frenzy such to the point I shared an article with my wife sex trafficking as it is at an all-time high in the city of Indianapolis this week why there is an industry of people that will desire this so there will be children that are going to be kidnapped and sold for the the sake of sex all week long. And do you know that the hotels have been trained to look for predators and to look for these sex traffickers because there are people in Indianapolis taking a stand saying, we're tired of it. We're tired of it. But if there's no demand for it, why does it show up? But there is a demand for it. The perversion of this world system is run by Satan and he filters into the world from every corner, not just on top, but from every corner he has his demonic realm stationed and they pour into the earth and you, it says here, you used to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That means that you got all of your instructions from Satan. Does anyone remember that time in your life? All of your instructions came from Satan. Who, who remembers? And you just were along for the ride. Everybody else is doing it. I may as well do it too. Every once in a while you get a group that says, well, nobody's doing this. And they start a group that nobody's doing it. And guess what? Everybody's doing, it. Everybody's doing what nobody else is doing. 
and they create their own patterns of conformity. And he said, when you were born into this culture, when you were born into this world system, you are here and you were affected by the demonic realm. You were affected by the satanic realm. You simply, born into the culture, born into the language of the liar Satan, you didn't even have to learn how to lie. How many of you told your lie without ever being trained how to lie? Come on. You knew the language. You knew how to get out of something. And no one had to train you how to lie. Because you knew the language. Where did you get that language? The prince of the air, Satan, the father of all lies, was pouring his culture into you and you conformed to the patterns of this world. But look what he says here. Verse 2 again, in which he once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So here we are on planet earth. And if you are still conforming to the patterns of the world and still doing the way, the things that everyone else does, you are a child of disobedience. As long as you stick to the pattern of this world, the way everybody else is doing it, you are a child of disobedience. Furthermore, look at verse 3. Among whom we all once conducted ourselves. Do you realize that nobody in this room, nobody on the planet can say, well, I never did that. We all conformed to the satanic agenda. We all learn the dance. We all learn the language. We all know how to work our way through this world. And we all learned it from the liar Satan who was infiltrating our lives. We were born in to sin. That's what Romans 5 teaches us. We were born into a sinful nature. We didn't even have to try to learn it. We were born in to a way of life. Then it says, in verse 3, We conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. In other words, when we were born into this world and we carried out the sins of the satanic realm, we were in opposition to God and His wrath was upon us. Think of what that means. Now, let's go to verse 4. But God. Can you all say that? But God. I have a feeling that God wanted to do something about this. You're on earth. Your life is infiltrated on every level by the satanic realm. And God says, I want to do something about this. And look what he does. But God, who is rich in mercy. If you're taking notes, write that down. This is what God did for you. Rich in mercy, number one. Two, by his great love with which he loved us. Five, even while we were dead in trespasses, we didn't deserve it. Great mercy was given to you. Great love and affection was poured out to you. Point three, you didn't deserve it. You were trapped and isolated in a system of sin and God looked upon you with great mercy, with great love, and you didn't deserve any of it, but he looked upon you and said, I'm going to do something about your situation. Can somebody say amen to that at all? I'm going to with rich mercy and love, and though you don't deserve it, I'm going to do something about your situation. Even when we're dead, verse 5, in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Isn't that amazing? Because of what Jesus did on the cross, the work of the cross, He saved you. That's the first step. He saved you from what? From sin. From death. 
from damnation, from total separation. He saved you from an earthly system. Now look what he does. Verses 6 and 7. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Where is Jesus right now? Luke 22. Let's go there. Above the earth. Can you stop for just a minute? I want to explain something. Paul says... He went into what he described the third heaven. I want all of you to understand this. Earth has an atmosphere with the earth all around it, the blue sky, all of that sort of stuff. That would be the first heaven. Does everybody understand that? Beyond our atmosphere, beyond the, the blue hue that we have around planet earth, you would get into the next realm of the stars and the galaxies and all of that. That would be called the second heaven. And then beyond the universe, beyond the galaxies, beyond what the human eye can see with a telescope is what? The heavenly realm. The third heaven. This is the heavenly realm. This would be where the throne of God is. This would be where heaven would be. This would be where God's existence is in the third heaven. Does everybody understand that? That there is a throne room there. God sits upon the throne around all things. And at the right hand of the Father is who? Jesus. 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 Look at what it says in Luke chapter 22. I want everybody to understand where we're going and what we're doing here this morning and what we're doing here on planet earth. You're just not cycling through a calendar and through all the latest fashions. God has us here for a divine purpose. Luke chapter 22, look at what it says in verse 66 through 71. As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they said, Are you then the Son of God? And he said to them, you rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Jesus declared about himself while he was down here in the earthly system that this earth is not where my throne is. My throne is up here in the heavenly realm and when I get there, I will sit on the right hand. What did the text say? Of the power of God. There is a power that has been given to Christ. And he wants to do something with that power. Go with me to Matthew chapter 28. I want you to see the power of God and what he wants to do with it through Christ. Matthew chapter 28. Look at verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Are you paying attention? Jesus is saying to his disciples, All authority has been given to me 
both in heaven, in the heavenly realm, and down here on earth. All of it, all of it is mine. We sing the song in our church. Satan is vanquished and Jesus is king. What do we mean by that? When Jesus went to the cross and conquered sin and death, he dethroned the powers that be around the earth and said, guess what, folks? I'm in charge. I've got the whole world in my hand. <laughs> He's got the whole deal. All principalities, all powers are subject to to Jesus Christ. So he sits at the right hand of the Father in the third heaven, in the heavenly realm, the throne room of God, if you will. And he sits at the right hand of power. And look what he says to his disciples in verse 19 of Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded to you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says to his disciples, I have work for you to do. I, the one that has all authority, am giving it to you, and I want you to execute my power in the earth. Go to Mark's version of the same discussion. Go to Mark 16. Mark 16 of the same exact conversation. Mark records just a little bit more. Mark 16 verse 17. Jesus says, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Is that power or what? Jesus is saying, I have conquered the normal pattern of this world that you are normally conformed to. I have destroyed that. And you don't have to listen to Satan. You can listen to Christ who has all authority been given to him. And he now wants to execute that power through you. Go with, go with me to Ephesians now again. Ephesians chapter 3. We're, in, we're studying chapter 2 but look at Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 10 and 11. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church. church. Are you the church? God wants to execute His power. See, everybody thinks that the church is just this nice little group that meets on Sunday and they're a harmless little group. But I've got news for you. God's intention is that the manifold wisdom of God be known to the church and executed somewhere. Look what it says. Might be known by the church to, what does it say? Principalities, Principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Who was that principality? that surrounds the earth, the principle of the earth? Satan, the prince of the air. Who might the church be pushing around at this point? Satan, get out of my way. All authority has been given to Jesus. Jesus has designated me as a power source to tell you to get out of my way. Amen. Do you understand what he has given us? Then he says... In the heavenly places, in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let me show you, you are down here on earth. This is you, this black dot. 
You are here. But Ephesians chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 says, He has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So where are you now if you are a follower of Christ? Physically, you are still here on earth, but spiritually, he has blasted you through every layer, and he says, come sit up here with me, child. Come sit up here with me. I've got some revelation knowledge for you. I have something that I want you to execute and I will send you back down to earth empowered to do what I'm asking you to do. No darkness can come against you. No authority can raise its ugly head against you. If you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, he says, come on up here, child. You have entrance into the throne room of God and I will have power made manifest in you and it's my intention that you, the church, speak forth to the principalities of the air. Get out of my face. So we, as children of God, are raised up. And the word here, it says, is to sit in heavenly places. Now, if you were here on Wednesday night, we studied this word sit. It actually is the word to dwell in the presence of. Are you catching this? Dwell in the presence of the heavenly realm. In other words... You are down here on earth not just to conform to the patterns of December, January, February, March, right through the calendar, just going through life like a zombie. Got to get the chocolate. Got to get the roses. Got to get my swimming suit. Most of us are just going through the motions and Jesus said, I saved you from more than that. I didn't just save you from your sins. I have called you into my purpose, which he established before the foundations of the earth that you would walk in them. Are you understanding what God has called you into? Now, once we are here, abiding in the, in, in the branch, I am the vine, you are the branches. In, Jesus says, you, the branches, abide in me. And I will abide in you and you will produce an abundance of fruit. But if you do not abide in Jesus, hear me on this church, if you do not abide here, if you do not come up to the level in which you have been called, you will stay down here and you will do the same pattern that everybody else is doing. But if you will abide in him, He will abide in you and you will produce an abundance of fruit for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, look at Ephesians 2 verse 7. This one just blows me away. That in the ages, circle that word in your Bible, ages, we are stuck right now in a time zone called an age, right? Right? Do you know that beyond this, we were studying it this morning, if, you don't, if you're not doing anything from 9 o'clock to like 10.30, come here on Sunday morning. We will show you where we're at on the time zone of God. We will show you what the news is telling you and we will show you where it's at in the Bible and we will show you the timetable. And we want you to know we are coming near to the end of this age. But the Bible says that there are ages coming. What does God want to do with us in the ages, plural, that are coming? Gee, I wonder. Everybody thinks maybe we'll get a harp and we'll float on a cloud and play little songs with Sylvester and Tweety. Bling, bling, bling. But do you know that for the ages to come, God has a plan to point back to his obedient children who have come up from the earth into his eternal realm 
and have come back to earth on assignment, he says, I want to point to you in the ages to come of what grace looked like, of what my power looked like, and what obedient children look like. He will use you in the ages to come as an object lesson. Here's what grace looks like. Here's what power looks like. And I've done it before, and I want the ages to come, whatever God is doing, he's going to show and point back to us and say, that's what it looks like. Are, are you catching this? Read verse 7 with me. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. It makes me wonder, is God going to use grace in any other age? Or is this the only age that he did it in? And if this is the age that he used grace in, you better shout a hallelujah a thousand times over. That he chose this generation. That he chose this race of people. And he says, I poured out my grace. And I will forever point to you as a picture of my grace. Are you catching? We're not just here to walk through this earth. God wants to forever use us as a piece of an example of obedience and surrender to the grace of God. You're either in on that or you're on the outside watching people do it. Amen? Now let's continue. Verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works lest anyone should boast. In other words, what you did to get out of this position of conformity and just doing what everyone else is doing was a gift from God. And when He called you up into the heavenly realm and gave you an assignment and gave you a power to do things and you came back here to earth and you did them, you have no bragging rights to say, look what I did. Everything that you carry forth, you carry forth as a delegate, as an ambassador of the Most High God, empowered by His Holy Spirit, and you never, ever take credit to yourself. This is not your deal. You are a part of the creation of God, the plan of God, and He's given you an assignment, and He says, come on up here, get it. It's a gift of grace to you. You can't work yourself in. There's nothing you could do to even get up into the heavenly realm by yourself, so don't ever think that you could. I surrender all, all to Jesus. I Surrender all to Him I freely give. If we will execute power, we can never do it in and of ourselves. Finally, why would God do all of this? Why would God do all of this? There's an abundance of mercy. An abundance of his love and an abundance of his grace. But look what he says in verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Do I have any creative people in this congregation? You've built something. And it was supposed to do something when you were done with it. Anybody ever do that? Let me see your hands. You made something. You built something. When it worked, when it worked, were you not thrilled? This is doing what it's supposed to do. And you were thrilled. Hey, as creative as I ever got was Legos with instructions. And when I built the Legos according to the directions, I said, look at that. Now look at that. I impressed myself. I built a little Lego world with people. And do you know, when you put them where they're supposed to be, they stay there. <laughs> they stay there until your big brother comes and knocks them down. And you say, no, 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 they don't belong down there. They belong here. 
That's what God is doing. Look what it says in verse 10. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God is saying to you, I love you. I have a plan for you. You will never know what the plan is just by reading the book alone. There are many mysteries. You'll be confused by this book. But if you will be called by his name, and respond to his voice. He is saying to you, come up here. And when you come up here into this eternal realm, there is divine revelation, divine wisdom, divine clarity, and divine power to carry out the work that he wants to do to do down here on earth. And it has been his plan since before the foundations of the world that you walk in it. So should we ever get nervous when you know God is speaking something into you? Should we ever have an ounce of fear that if God is speaking something into you, why would we ever have fear if he went to all that trouble to say, I'm about to do this through you. You better listen to me and carry out what I have planned since the beginning, the foundations of the world. I knew you by name, and I've called you out of darkness, and I've got a plan for you, and I want you to carry it out, not just by your will, but by the will of the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Man, if the church operated like this, there would be no scandal. If the church operated like this, the intention of God, there would be power all over the place. There would be people executing the power of God at the command of God. But what we have become is religious institutions that make people feel good about their sins and we coddle them to the point in which they cannot be powerful. And we have a, a, an isolated few that will walk in the power and everybody else is invited to watch. That's most of the revivals in America. But God is saying that's not just for the preachers and the evangelists. That is for the follower of Jesus Christ. I've noticed that religion attempts through works to keep us from that heaven and realm. That's right. Keep us busy doing stuff down here and we'll never go up here and find out what the real plan is. Absolutely right. Are you, are you getting this this morning? Does the picture help at least a little? Please tell me the picture helps a little. I know, and eventually it just becomes a blob of black scribble. So we're not supposed to buy candy for our wives. Amen. Hallelujah. Madness. March Madness. No, it's not Marty's birthday. It's March Madness. There's something every month. There's something every month. The buyers of this and sellers of this world want us to be conformed to the patterns. And God says, I want you to break out of the pattern. That's why I came. I came to shatter the patterns of this world. And Satan and religion would love to keep you bound to the patterns of this world because a lot of people make a lot of money, including religious institutions that stay connected to the calendar. Are you hearing me? This isn't even God's calendar. If you actually read the Bible, you'll find out that the Jews follow a, a, a different calendar. And they have different Feast and celebration. And guess what? Every feast and celebration of the Israelites is focused on Jehovah God. Everyone. But if we will recognize that we're here and Satan is trying to put a certain amount of static into your life and keep you bound in the traditions of man. He doesn't care if you go to church. Just don't execute power. He doesn't care if you know all the hymns in the hymn book. He doesn't care if you even memorize a few scriptures. Just don't execute power. Why? 
Because if you do, he has to go. If you execute the power of God, which is greater than the power of Satan, guess what? He has to roll out of your way. This just screams out Hebrews 4 that we're told that we can enter boldly into the throne room of grace. Nobody else can. That's right. And he's trying to keep us in this realm so that we don't get to that realm and find out what God wants us to do. But we have access. What is our access to the throne room of God? The shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. The shed blood of Jesus Christ gives you access. You don't have to wonder if you can come up here. The shed blood of Jesus Christ in your life gives you access that you can go boldly to the throne room of grace. Isn't this amazing? There are churches in this country that would like you to just stay down here and be busy. They're not of God. Are you hearing me? Yep. They're not of God. God says the church doesn't know enough. You have to come up here and get divine revelation from me and I will tell you exactly what you need to do. I will, I will give you the clear road for you to go on. The word of God will always back up what you hear up here. He will never ask you to go outside of the boundaries of what he's already spoken. Do you understand that? But revelation and understanding it and walking in it is what we need. See, what I'm suggesting is more than a suggestion. It is the word of God. This is his desire for us. This has been a constant theme almost every day I wake up. God says, where are you starting? Are you starting here or are you starting here? He's asking me. And I don't think he's looking for me to answer the question. <laughs> I think he's telling me. When God gives you an A or B question, are you starting here or are you starting here? He's trying to tell you, you're starting down here. You need to come up here where I am and then go in power down where you are. He's saying the same thing to you, Joe. Sunday night, we sat downstairs and I listened to the pastor talk about the power and invoking that power and commanding. I went home that night and I said, but he doesn't understand my daughter's sick. There's no Satan involved here. She's just sick. And I wasn't entirely confident, but I went upstairs that night when we said our prayers... I put my hand on her head and I commanded. And within four days, it was revealed to us how Satan had sabotaged my little girl. Worked his way into our family and did his work and virtually, in a sense, crippled my daughter for weeks. And it was revealed to us where that came from. It's gone. And my little girl called me Friday afternoon, said, Dad, I can read. I can see. Because of what was put on her by the hand of the enemy and what was removed through invoking that power. Praise God. It's just amazing stuff. See, I don't even think Satan minds when we pray sometimes. Because we, here's what we'll do. Down here in our earthly situation, will beg God to do stuff that He's already given you to do. We're begging God to release our children from something. And He's saying, come up here. I've already given you, as a delegate, as an ambassador, ambassador of mine, the power to execute, devil, get off my child. Get out of my way. And I, I just shouted for joy when you, you guys told me, this is divine revelation. When you commanded, revelation came forward and God showed it for what it was. It was not just a sickness. The enemy was up to no good. This is, this is what God wants you to see. And if you will walk in it, oh man, you will be power-filled vessels for the glory of God and the earth will never be the same again for you walking on it in his power. Let's bow our heads. Just a simple question. Pastor, I get it.
I want to walk in it. If that's you, just raise your hand. Me too. I get it. I want to walk in it. Heavenly Father, hear our cry. We're done with religious ceremony. We're done with endless things that don't work. And we have seen, according to your divine will and plan, there is power to be executed, delegated authority that belongs to you, that you've put into your church. And Father, we want to walk in it. We don't want to be confused about this. We want to walk with your wisdom, your divine revelation and understanding and power by your Holy Spirit. So I pray, Father, that in this house, you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. It would be evident and known that you are working in us and through us for your great glory. We ask this accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this is a perfect setup for tonight. Six o'clock, we're coming here. And we have taught on prayer for two weeks. Tonight, we're coming here with the express desire to know Him. I think many of you, most of your existence is stuck down here. And you don't know His voice very well. Tonight, I invite you to come here. Six to whatever time. Whatever time you want to believe. There's not going to be a start. There's not going to be a dismissal. But it's starting at 6 o'clock tonight. I want you to come and be a part of powerful, effective prayer in which you are introduced to His voice. That's tonight at 6. You come in. If you have to go for whatever reason, you go. You want to stay, you stay. I'm not putting anything on anybody except to say the invitation is here to go here. And I believe if you'll respond to that, God will meet with you tonight and reveal himself in ways you never even dreamed possible. Let the world do what the world's doing. Let's pursue his presence. Amen? Amen. God bless you. I love you all. Let's walk in his power and watch what God does. Amen? Amen. Have a great afternoon. See you here at 6.